Lawrence Snell here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics, and the strategies to help you grow your strength training business. If you prefer to read, you can download the transcript for this podcast over at highintensitybusiness.com. Just search for episode 362, and there's a button on the post to download the transcript. This is episode 362, obviously, and today's guest is Al Coleman. Al became interested in strength exercise in high school to improve his performance as a baseball player. This interest became a passion when he went on to play Division I baseball and was at the mercy of ill-informed strength coaches, needing to find a better way to keep him injury-free than was what was being presented to him by the college strength and conditioning staff. He chanced upon the super slow technical manual while combing the shells of a borders. A few years later, in 99, our passed the test of the most stringent certification in the industry, the super slow exercise specialist certification. Al then spent the next 10 years under the tutelage of master instructor Rob Sereno and owned his craft. From 2010 to 2019, Al worked for Renex Overload Fitness, uh, as well as Overload Fitness, which I'm sure the listeners know well, where he served as director of education. During this time, he worked in close concert with Ken Hutchins, Josh Trentine, and Gus Diamantopoulos in refining the Renex protocol. In 2019, now moved back to the Washington to Washington DC and began to work with Nicole Gustafson, if hopefully I've said that correctly, and her team. Uh, in reconnecting with Nicole, Al found both the ideal business and life companion. Very romantic. Yeah. And Al, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be with you again. Thank you for having me, Lawrence. You're most welcome. So Phoenix Strength. How's things going? Give us an update. It sounds like you've had a really positive start to the year. Yeah. So uh, when you were asking me before, uh, since I've con- considered my, my answer a little bit, and what, what I meant to say, I think, was um, business has been consistent. Nothing been has been like vastly different as far as volume or anything like that goes. But inside the studio itself, um, we've been having a lot of a lot of fun. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of our, our long-term clients are uh, happier than ever. Um, you know, kind of kind of leaving their workouts, uh, feeling like they really got something done. Like the feedback for all, you know, that I get, that Nicole and I get uh, from from clients, from, from about all our instructors at this point is, um, you know, they like all the changes that, that we've kind of made and, the things we're toying around with and it's just kind of breathed a lot of new life back into the place. And what I, what I mean by that uh, to be a little bit more specific is, you know, you know, as we go a little bit further, one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm writing about uh, is, is this obsession I've kind of gained with gained over the years with uh, rhythm and pacing uh, and exercise uh, as an attempt to standardize the fundamental component of a workout, the repetition. Uh, which is something, you know, obviously that has been done before. Uh, that's the, the idea behind super slow. Uh, but, you know, my, my genesis was uh, taking that a little, a little bit further uh, as far as standardization and finding ways, not because I think standardizing a rep is the end all be all. It's just that that is the major uh, expressive kind of behavioral component of a workout. It's, it's the thing that, if we standardize our other variables are meaningful again. So, you know, one of the things over the years that I think a lot of people in the high intensity community have struggled with uh, is describing failure to clients and getting clients to accept the idea of uh, muscular failure and being okay with that. You know, you, you tell them till they're blue in the face that you want them to fail that, you know, they fail and then you say, good, that's what I wanted you to do. It, it, and they they should nod their head yes, but they're you know, with, with some hesitation. It's like oh okay, whatever you say, right? Uh, it doesn't feel like you did what you were supposed to, even though you were told you did well, right? And I think what people mean by that is they failed, but they really didn't. The exercise ended, but they were left feeling like yeah, there's a little bit left in the tank they could have extracted, but it came up on them a little bit suddenly, or they stopped, or who knows what, right? But to our eyes, they failed. At least we think they did. And we measure that and, and say good job and they move on. Um, but because of that, that variance and that 
you know, that kind of uncertainty, you know, we, we toy around with these metrics and variables um, and have over time kind of, you know, come to a conclusion that they're important, but not so, not as important as kind of reaching failure. That's the big, that's the big goal of, of the exercise. Um, and one of the things that I've seen over the years, and especially through my, my study of motor learning and understanding like how the body works with regards to it's always moving towards automaticity and efficiency, um, the concept of failure for people becomes automatized and more efficient over time. And what I mean by that is, you know, physiologically, you're trying to consciously mediate something that your body tooth and nail does not is going to fight you to do. You know, we are we are trying to make a a particular muscular structure fail, which can't happen, by the way. But um, we're, we're, that's what we're attempting to do. Um, what do you mean and, it can't happen because the brain will stop it from happening? Is that yeah, what you're saying? I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, strictly speaking, mm. something very bad would happen if a muscle fail. <laughs> you know, it's not uh, it, 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 that that actual event doesn't occur. You know, it, there's a mechanical failure. There's a number of a confluence of events that occur that create the cessation of movement. It's not necessarily just muscular in nature, but um Using that as an objective um, of a workout seems objective, uh, but but it's really extremely subjective in, in, in a number of ways. And um, you know, and so over the years, I what I I saw with myself and with with uh, other instructors and colleagues who I spoke with throughout the years is you know the frustration was always we're trying to get a client to comprehend failure. You know, we're always working to refine things, you know, keep their face relaxed, have them breathe freely, stay calm, move all, all these things so that they don't get in the way of failure so that they can stay calm and, and reach this, this point of failure as, as this goal we're hanging off in the distance. Um, and what I understand now about the nervous system and the brain and physiology in general and, atten and attention and behavior um, is Again, you are trying to put your attention and, and objectivity on an event, number one, that actually can't happen. Number two, um, you don't know when it's going to happen. So its predictability is pretty poor, um, which doesn't give your nervous system very good direction. Right. Let me just ask um, you one question. Sure. So can't we make failure objective if we use the definitions by the likes of, I think it was... Dr. James Fisher or his colleagues who came up with a definition, which I'm not going to know off the top of my head, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the, it's the definition that we all kind of use, which is that, you know, even though you're using as much effort as you can, you mm -hmm. simply cannot, you know, the exercise ceases yeah. to, to, to continue. You can't move the resistance anymore. Yeah, uh, can't we be objective in that sense? This is where yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of where I'm going with this. I just okay. would like to, to redefine, failure in a lot of ways, but I also don't try to make it an immediate objective. I, it's a side effect. In other words, if I get the person to pay attention to what I'm asking them to do, real failure by definition would happen to a person in spite of what they're trying to do, right? If, if I'm intending to fail, I'm going to, going to fail, but you know, that's not like a real physiological failure in the sense that I'm kind of controlling this process whereby if I put my attention on, on a mechanical action, I'm really just focused on that mechanical action and failure sneaks up and hits me. That's failure. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you think if someone um, focuses on just failure, they will fail sooner. Is that they I'm, will because that yep. again, the way like attention and behavior works is if I put my, if I, if I hang out this, this, this imaginary concept of failure as a piece of cheese out in front of me, um, you know, my, and I'm focused on that and my physiology becomes accustomed to what that feels like again, because it's subjective in nature, my brain is going to get more efficient and gradually back off what it's considering to be failure. And you watch this with people. And I think that to a large degree was what people saw with the phenomena of signature time under loads um was this new kind of attentional set point that yes. people that that was being kind of 
hung out there. Uh, and the reason I say that is because a lot of the things that have been manipulating lately uh, have, have broken a lot of those molds. Um, and I, I just, there's not a lot of things I don't know. I'm just t- talking about what I'm observing is that um, by kind of manipulating a little bit, uh, some of the objectives you're working with during, during a workout, um, you don't see failure happen as predictably anymore, uh, which in my opinion would, would actually be failure. Uh, if it becomes too predictable, uh, you have to question what's causing the, you know, what's causing that event to become so predictable. Uh, and this kind of gets into an, the idea of, of the nature of what a repetition really is, but I'm not going to get into that for now. Well, well, so, so where do you, so where you're going with this, it sounds like mm-hmm. is what you, you were kind of connecting this back to why you're having such a great time right now, yeah. getting clients, yeah. great experiences, great yeah. results. And mm-hmm. you, it's linked to this idea of you're getting them to focus on something else, something about the process rather than the outcome. It sounds Absolutely. like, can you elaborate? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's how I would put it, you know? So, you know, we focus on the process of exercise, refining, you know, and then that's one of the other issues that I think we've always contended with, with people is, uh, we want their technique to be perfect. So we're giving this them this task of perfect your technique and that, that increases the intensity, but we also want you to produce a hundred percent effort towards reaching muscular failure. Wh- which one is it? I can't, I can't, you know, to, to some degree, I can't do both. That uh, is confusing for a lot of people actually. Yes. Yeah. Good point. And, and so the, my whole plight over the years has been trying to iron out that skill component to make that less relevant. Like any, like anything you would learn, you know, someone would, would remark that when they become skilled at something, when it becomes easy, they say, I'm getting into a rhythm, I'm getting into a flow. I, you know, I'm gaining momentum. You know, th- these various phrases we use to describe the state where things start becoming more zone. automatic. Yeah. And when that happens, we can now allocate our other resources towards the task at hand without having to worry about how we're managing the task. And that that's one of the big problems with exercise is we're actually, the way we ask people to pay attention, we're actually asking them to manage the task rather than produce effort. Um, you know, by asking someone to internalize their effort, like focus on focus on your glutes when you're doing a leg press. Uh, in the motor learning literature, that's what they would call an internal form of focus. And, and it's pretty much well understood at this point that that's the best way to screw up a skill. And, and and cause basically the, the event of choking. Um, what does that mean? You, well, like in a performance event, you know, when you have a singer who chokes on stage or someone goes out to give, give a speech, they choke. It's because their attention becomes on their inward process. Right, okay. Right, right. Um, this is quite controversial, isn't it? Because a lot of our colleagues will focus on like mental focus on a specific muscle group. Yeah. 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 So this mm-hmm. is, this is, um, I'm writing about this as well, but this is one of the problems with uh, the current usage of a lot of the blending, a lot of the mindfulness literature that's coming from the psychotherapy world and the, the you know the neuroscience world and trying to integrate it in in an exercise. And that's a topic for another day. But basically, you know, so that I don't get too confusing is uh, you know there's subsets of motor learning. It's not just like one umbrella. There's the subset that I'm speaking about specifically at the moment is the attention and behavioral side. Uh, there's a book. Uh, it's probably 13 or 14 years old at this point, but uh, this this author's uh, one of the editors of the one of the major uh, academic texts in, in motor learning. Uh, I'm looking at the book now, so I'm pulling it off my shelf. It's um, it's one of these life-changing books for me, honestly. And, and Rob Sereno, uh, you know, brought it to my attention. Uh, and uh, I haven't been able to find a copy on Amazon for under like 300 bucks in a while. So it's called <laughs> Atten- Attention and Motor Skill Learning by Gabrielle Wolf. Okay. Um, and it's all, it's okay. all research about uh, the effects of skill development based on what you ask the individual to pay attention to. All right. So if I'm teaching somebody to swing a baseball bat, there's two ways I can do that. There's the, there's the task of hitting the ball to whatever direction it is I'm trying to send it to. So let's just say I asked the hitter to hit it to right center. All right. 
that would be what we call an external focus. You're asking them to place their attention on the end goal, right? Uh, an internal focus would be, all right, I want you to put your hands on the bat here, you know, put it, put it in these digits, hold it here. I want you to put your hands here. You set them up. And then you ask, now, as you go through your swing, I want you to focus on leading with your hips, blah, 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 blah. All right. Yeah, you are like chopping this process yeah. up into a million segments. Now, that's required whenever you teach somebody a skill initially. All right. You have to give them enough information. But, but, the, but to go any further with it is usually a problem uh, because the way we're, there's an ecology to, to learning a skill. It's not just a person learning a skill. The nervous system, as human beings, we're responders to our environmental constraints. So the things that are happening around us, our nervous system simply responding to it. And we place our attention on things in the environment so that our nervous system can respond accordingly. Um, and a good way to describe this, I think, is a, a phenomena in, in the motor learning um, literature that was kind of seen in the early 20th century. It was called Bernstein's Hammer. Uh, Nikolai Bernstein was a he's a Russian researcher and he was studying blacksmiths and he wanted to see, um, you know, why some blacksmiths were more accurate than others. Uh, you know, so he got a bunch of blacksmiths in and, and, you know, had the skilled ones and the ones who weren't so great. And the idea of the repetition was, that, you know, they went into the study saying, basically, we want to see the difference in repetition between the skilled and the bad. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the skilled one basically meant that the blacksmith was basically hitting the same spot repeatedly over and over and over. And the other ones weren't. All right. Uh, and they used this technology at the time. It's kind of like CGI, but it's called cyclography, where they put light bulbs all over oh, the yeah. object, the hammer and the arms. And they use high speed cameras and then overlay them. All right. Um, and what they saw with the unskilled blacksmith was no was no, you know, you no know, surprise. They they weren't hitting their spot and every single stroke was different. Okay? Mm -hmm. But when they went to the skilled blacksmith, it was the same, except the skilled blacksmith staying hit the same spot every time, but not once did their stroke repeat itself. Um, the, the brain, the body never takes the same pathway to, to an end goal ever. There's no such thing as a repetition. Because <laughs> uh, there's too many sort of external in environmental factors affecting that motion. Well, yeah, not robots. because the environment, yeah. nothing's yeah. staying static. Yeah, I mean, yeah. everything in your environment's moving around, and every single one of your sense organs is responding to that in some way. Yeah. So That's your body is always on the go, trying to mediate itself based on this end goal you've given. All right. Um, now, how I apply that to exercise is, you know, one of the things we purport in the high intensity world is we have this biomechanically precise equipment. It's got these awesome resistance curves, you know, these great constraints. We keep you locked in the machine. It's going to make the exercise easier to learn, the more directed on the targeted muscle, you know, and all of that's correct. So why would we put somebody in an exercise and then ask them to think about how they're doing it? Um, shouldn't the machine's arc take care of that? Um, I can't choose which muscles I'm using in an exercise. You can't self-select, you know, yes, I can put my attention on my chest muscles and, and my brain can make those muscles fire. But, you know, the net effect of that, that type of, uh, you know, in, increase in activity doesn't have much of an outcome on, on the, Got it. you know, the stimulation of target muscle any more than an increased load would really, uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it actually is detrimental because one of the other things that this motor learning research has shown, um, again, and this is this kind of goes back to this internal focus thing, is when you place your attention on what you're doing from a bodily standpoint, um, your your brain's more likely to co-contract, to contract musculature surrounding the involved joints that aren't necessarily responsible for action at, at that joint um so you know hang on just let me let sir. me make sure i understand that yep. so sorry i might have missed a bit there because i was trying to recenter the microphone so yep. if you do place mental focus on a muscle group you're actually more likely to involve surrounding 
muscle groups. Absolutely. Is that correct? Got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which they, is they, kind of un- not the intent there, is it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Interesting. Now, uh, so, you know, and this, I, I've, ex- I've seen this a lot, you know, I, I, I years ago, there's this interesting phenomenon when I, when I started, uh, when uh, Josh and I were doing a lot of stuff at Renex, we had people coming by all the time to like look at equipment and uh, you know, Josh would just make me do the demonstrations. I do like a leg press every day of the week sometimes for people. What's was, a failure? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was geez. ridiculous. Um, it was fun. A lot of fun. But I've watched you um, work out on YouTube and it's uh, I feel you're uh, I, I, it's painful yeah. to watch. <laughs> yeah. No, no. There was a there was a there was a period of time there where I was doing that a lot. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm I'm saying it jokingly because because it was awesome. But uh <laughs> But but one of the things that I started noticing over time was I, I was putting demonstrations on for people, right? So I was trying to make sure that I was moving 10 and 10. And sometimes I was tired and it wouldn't actually go to failure. You know, I'd choose a, a light weight to demonstrate it. Now, mm. I'm sure every trainer out there who's done this will kind of know this. Um, you get a you get a person, you put in an exercise, a male, it's like 200 pound male, you put them in a medex chest press. He, he struggles with like 160 pounds. You're like, what is going on here? <laughs> There's no way based on this man's body size, he could be this weak. Um, and that's, I, I found that's not what's happening. What's happening is the slower you ask somebody to move, you're making it more of a constraining and um, fine motor task. Okay. You're, ter- you're turning a gross motor task into a fine one, basically, by slowing down the movement past to a certain point. And it doesn't matter how much loads on there at some point, moving that slowly burns. (laughs) It burns with a hundred pounds. It burns with 400 pounds. It burns period when you move that slowly. And so, because I would get on this equipment and I demonstrate a leg press with a minuscule weight and, you know, number one, because I'm not trying to go to failure. I'm not like in the zone or I'm trying to work out. I'm just demonstrating. I have a minuscule amount of weight on there and like three repetitions into it. I'm like, why is this burning so bad? You know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm way stronger than this. Yeah. And it, that, that phenomena happened enough times over the years to make me realize that that's kind of what's happening with people in the studio. They're just demonstrating with the light weight and it burns. And at some point they get sick of the burning and they stop and quote unquote fail. And we could and, be low balling the weight massively yeah there as well right okay. yeah and they get off the exercise and you're like why, why aren't you breathing heavy i don't <laughs> yeah. you know uh it, and it's 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 simply because again i think the intention of moving too slowly is too much of an internal focused task that's actually causing uh and, and again this also explains a lot of the phenomena i think a lot of high intensity people have also experience with like a big five where you do a big five and you know you get row back <laughs> run over by a truck you just feel destroyed for for a week um and i th- i think that's i think that's a result of number one i think um going after the wrong definition of failure i'll say that uh and number two uh making the task too internal and just draining resources that aren't directly responsible for uh work at the targeted muscle really um mm-hmm. you know i i think you know a lot of the, what people experienced over the years training once a week and losing muscle mass although they were getting stronger was because yeah they were getting more skilled at moving a heavier load uh, but the musculature they exercised recovered a while ago uh but the system hadn't and so they needed that time before they could demonstrate that same level of strength again uh but it wasn't because the musculature involved wasn't ready for another belt of the mm-hmm. stimulus, I think, you know, and this it's conjecture, I'm not, I'm not claiming anything, yeah. but it's just observation over the years, both in myself and, and, and my clients, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the smoother and, and more automatic they've been able to move the deeper in the muscular fatigue they've, they get and the less, you know, the, the feeling that they can come back and do it again a lot faster is there too. So, um, but I digressed a little bit there. My point Sorry, is you're but, building this right up. I'm really excited. Yeah. Go on. 
Uh, I was kind of, I diverged off the path of talking about the the different forms of focus, but like, um, I'm not going to pull it up right now, but in in this book, I specifically remember they did a study with, with a biceps curl where they placed EMG sensors on, on individuals, uh, like at the forearm, the bicep, the tricep, the chest, you know, various places throughout the body. Uh, and with one set of subjects, they say, we want you to focus on, on your bicep and on bending of your elbow as you curl the bar. All right. And they, they looked at the EMG um, readouts and, and then they did, they asked another set of subjects to do the same thing. But this time they said, I just want you to focus on bringing the bar from here to here. Okay. Now, again, there's a, there's, there's problems with that. <laughs> Meaning if you wanted that experiment to be exactly the same, you need to make sure that certain things were constrained so that the person couldn't mess it up. Right. Uh, like if you wanted that experiment to be pure, and I'm sure it wasn't. So, uh, but the, but what they saw was interesting um, that, that the EMG activity in the biceps in both, uh, in both experiments was relatively similar, a little bit higher in the internal focus one, but relatively similar with the, similar with the external one, but with the, external focus, the global GM, EMG activity of the musculature surrounding the bicep was grossly lower. So just by placement of attention on the object instead of the body. All right. So a lot of this actually has to do with somewhat with imagery, what, what we're consciously attending to during an exercise. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to explain in that it's, it's really just a slight shift of uh, you're not, not paying attention to the body, but you're not, you're using it as feedback more or less. Like you're paying attention to what you're doing and then you feel the musculature you're working, but it's a side effect, right? You're not going after that. Um, and in, in truth, that's really the only way it could be. And that's the way it should be, right? You want <laughs> You, you want to know how to, your body should be acting against this thing, but it has to be based on that thing first. Uh, and I think a, a lot of the way we, we go from a top-down approach when teaching high-intensity training, saying, no, all that matters is the musculature. The machine's just there along for the ride. Right, right. Yeah. I go, yeah, but the ride was cor- supposedly correct, you know, constructed with this perfection in mind. <laughs> so why wouldn't we just go along for the ride? <laughs> uh, you, you know, um, we should be going along for the ride, you know. We should be instead of doing something else while this machine's going along for the ride, we should be following the machine. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've we've created it with this assumption that it's awesome, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, so it, it it's one of these things where you don't have to assume uh the musculature involved in an exercise if the exercise is set up correctly. Uh and so that task should be relatively ironed out and, and skilled and put it out of the way so that all the persons you know, resources can be allocated towards their effort. Well, so let's just focus on that for a second, because this sure. is the getting to the how this manifests for you in yeah. terms of what you do get the client to focus on. So mm-hmm. just if I understood that correctly, so you're you're making sure that the setup part of the client's ex, you know introduction to an exercise is is nailed before they even start. So you're what explaining how they get into the machine, their, you know, how they their posture, whether they should, mm-hmm. should be, how they should be gripping the handles, yeah. all those kinds of things, mm-hmm. neutral head position, et cetera. Is that what you're referring right. to here? Yeah. So um, one of the, th- one of the things that's really changed about the way I teach exercise is um, well, without, without going too, too far into this, I, there are, there has been some useful things gleaned from the, the functional training world uh, by and large, most of it's, you know, it's, it's creative. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's haphazard and it's one of those things that has no barrier to entry, right? Uh, anyone can make up anything at any time. It's kind of the nature of functional training. Yeah. Um, and then that part bothers me. Um, but one of the, one of the, the concepts that I think does hold a lot of clout is the idea of really teaching trunk stabilization um, during everything that you're doing. Uh, because if you understand biomechanics in any type of human movement, everything f- from a physics perspective has to, you know, works efficiently when the spine is organized correctly. Um, 
I don't have to self-select what areas of the body I'm using to do a task if I have this rigid pole driven into the ground and everything moves around it. All right. So one of the things that I've really focused on to a greater degree, even though it's always been part of our literature, and we emphasize it, we talk about it during our, our first workout with people, and we we repeat it over and over again during an exercise to people to try to get them put your head, you know, put your head back in neutral, whatever we say to them, these corrective things. Um, but I'm actually a little bit more forceful about it now up front. And what I mean by that is not not <laughs> aggressively forceful, but yeah. I, I make it certain they understand that they have two jobs during an exercise. And, and one I call the primary postural task. And the second um, I call super postural task. And I get that from motor learning too. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that as well. But the primary postural task is, is the same basically during every exercise. It's the position of your spine, which could change during certain exercises. When you consider things like uh, trunk extension, trunk flexion, rotation. Mm-hmm. But for the gross number of exercises, the position of the spine should be relatively fixed, uh, as well as the head and neck, because it's part of that complex. And so I tell people, okay, like a block of Jen- like like a stack of Jenga blocks. That thing does not move for the rest of the exercise. The moment it does, you're done. All right. That's your primary task. You F that up. You're done. (laughs) Uh, And they, you know, and I'm not blunt about it. And they go, all right. (laughs) And they don't mess it up. You know, it's like a, it's like a game. You know, you, you sit kindergarten kids down and say, all right, let's see. You can sit still for 30 seconds. You know, you watch them bottle up. They'll do it. You make a game out of it. They'll do it. Clients will do that too. You know, if you say, hey, you know, you're going to shortchange yourself if you if you let your spine move. Now, people think that's overly anal. But the, the point is, I'm I'm getting something set up for them to get it out of the way, because with repeated practice, that becomes intuitive for them to set themselves up that way. And that becomes what in baseball we used to call set it and forget it. You know, there's yeah. certain things I don't want to have to attend to that throughout the exercise. So even so, if they they the you know they they break break that form for a split second, yeah. When you so you won't even give them the opportunity to give them corrective feedback. You'll just cease the exercise. Yeah, the first few okay. times. Okay. Okay. The first few times. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a complete jerk about it. I'll just harp on them about it all the time yeah. because if I put the legwork in up front, I don't have to. Um, yeah. Again, this doesn't have to be one of these complicated things where we de- demean people. We're just very straightforward about like, hey, before we even get into the rest of these, before we even concern yourself about what you're getting out of the workout, this is the first thing I'm asking you to do. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. You know? Can I make and an it, observation? It sounds like Absolutely. to me that you have, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong here, mm-hmm. but you have, you have almost done a Pareto law on all of the instruction and I know we're only just getting into this and I, I love learning yeah. about specifics that you get into like the Jenga sure. uh, metaphor, but yeah. you're almost doing like an 80, 20 on all of the stuff you used to say and do prior and during an exercise. Yeah. Um, because it's, this is what you found to be the most meaningful yeah. and get the best result. But I'll Absolutely. let you continue. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one of the things that I've, I've really gone to great lengths with again, in this, I kind of like I explained last time a little bit over the past years, I kind of fell in love with baseball again through, the motor learning thing and studying biomechanics. And one of the things that has interested me the most is the, you know, all the bio with all the biomechanical analysis. Now they, they can predict how much a pitcher is going to be off of his target by the level of his, by the, by the, how level his eyes are to the horizon of the ground when his front foot hits the ground. So head and neck position being deviated by a few degrees can grossly affect the placement of the ball. And, and this, you know, this is one of these things where in that world and most of the athletic world now, they're really, really honing, uh, really emphasizing, you know, trunk stabilization, head and neck position because it's the it's the pull that everything gets tethered to. Yeah. And if you make sure that that is organized and is not a variable factor anymore, uh, and that's that's all I try to get across to clients in the beginning. This isn't something we want to continue to harp on. Let's, let's just work on this first, get this, understand this, 
At first, we're defining failure in the exercise as your inability to do this. All right. They get that within a workout or two, and we get that out of the way, and I don't have to think about it again. Um, and I've included something else um, that I will get into another time, but uh, the use of uh, performance bite guards. Um, is, uh, there's a couple companies now that make them. Um, one's called New Age Performance, and one is Airwave. Uh, I think it was made by some CrossFitters. And, uh, but uh, it comes from the dentistry world uh, right. for the most part. I'm not going to get too deep into that. But What is it? Um, it's they're bite guards that go on oh, the, uh, yeah. on, on the uh, molars down here. And when you clamp down, there's enough of kind of a, a leverage block in the back that it aligns your jaw. And when you, you clamp down and you contract your masseter muscle, now most of the muscles in your face are antagonistic to your masseter muscles. So we tell people relax your face when, if they actually squeeze their jaw against something, now this is the problem. If you don't have anything in there and you do that, then you're just grinding your teeth that's right. a problem because then you have sliding of the jaw and then you have all this global tension and neck neck stuff going on but when you put a wedge in there and you clamp down it actually pulls your chin in and sticks your head straight up like a pole it, it fixes your spine um and it and doesn't it, does it does it obstruct breathing in any way no it opens breathing up okay. uh, because it what, it what it does is when you contract that well in there's a couple of theories here. The, the mouthpiece that I like better has this little tab that mm. when you bite it, it actually keeps your tongue depressed at the bottom of your mouth. And in so doing, it keeps the tongue there. And, you know, your tongue's attached to your diaphragm. So a lot of the valsalva maneuver pulls the tongue down the back of the throat. And that's why it obstructs breathing. If, if the tongue stays pinned under okay. this thing, your airway stays open. So your breathing's actually opened up and it makes it more difficult. Let me not say it that way. It, it redirects the Valsalva maneuver productively. Let me put it that way. Instead of it causing the behavior that we don't want, it kind of channels it to go in the right direction that we do. Want. And you have all clients wearing these? Yeah. All of During them. A uh, well, the ones that the ones that have bought it yeah i mean <laughs> I, I've, I've asked yeah. most of them to buy it and most of them do and um it it helps it's, what it's really re like 40 bucks 50 okay. bucks something like that and you got to replace them every now and then but um mm -hmm. the second one i mentioned the airwave the crossfit one i actually like a lot better um but it's corrected a lot of the breathing problems we have with people in the head and neck position stuff all you have to say is bite and breathe through your mouth Possibly. uh and you don't, I, I barely ever have to mention to somebody how to breathe anymore. Uh, it, I'm buying one. This is yeah, interesting. No, no. Yeah. Now it takes a little getting used to. Uh, and one of the things that I, I have noticed in clients who start wearing them, I had to remind them of, uh, again, this is one of these things where you, th you think as an instructor, what would come intuitively to a person just doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. So you, I had these bike guards and I'm watching people and they're like in the middle of the exercise, sloshing it around in their mouth. I'm like, I'm not, it's not going to do anything if you don't bite it. That's the whole yeah. whole point, you know. So uh, yeah, as long as you bite, yeah, yeah, as mm -hmm. long as you bite the thing, it positions everything in the, the jaw and, and you know the tongue in such a way that your breathing opens up without you having to think about it. And that's yeah. the key. Yeah, you know, yeah. is that we're setting up. And, and again, there's a um, like I said, there's subdivisions of motor learning, and 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 one of the one of the operating theories now is what's called the constraints led approach to motor learning, where skill development is taught by constraining the things that you don't want to happen. Um, so instead of consciously coaching somebody how to do something, you basically ask them to do this thing, but you block what you don't want to happen. Like in the Medex lumbar extension is a great example. You don't want hip extension during trunk extension. So the restraint system is in place to inhibit that, right? So all you have to say to the person is extend your trunk and the wrong thing doesn't happen they're constrained just aside um, and i'm yep. just asking this for my own benefit but i'm sure it's interesting mm -hmm. to listeners too with the lumbar extension even if you get it perfect in terms of how tight you'd make those restraints and how much you press the the feet that push the femur into the hip and make sure that that back roller doesn't move there's still mm -hmm. some glute and hamstring recruitment it's impossible to avoid that completely am i right or yeah and you shouldn't try and yeah. turn it off either yeah. um 
that's again, that would be an internal focus. Yes. Um, that's, that's not something that you should have to operationalize, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just, if you have the constraint set up properly and the person is moving the movement arm at a rate that's consistent, the sequencing of muscular action during the exercise will be consistent from one rep to the next. And, um, you know, it, you won't have erratic loading and you won't have, um, you won't have disproportionate loading mm -hmm. because the expression of movement being consistent is evidence that you don't have erratic loading. Got it. Uh, and that's, you know, as long as that's the intention during the exercise and the person's restrained properly, you know, the sequencing of muscular events that we want to occur will, you know, we don't have to choose that. Okay. Yeah, I intend to, to do a whole podcast focused on the lumbar and execution and set mm -hmm. up with, well, someone like yourself at some point, because yeah. it's, it's something I haven't really covered yet. But sorry, I took you off track. You were, sure. you were, you uh, were getting into, yeah, you were talking about using constraints to. Yeah, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Um, yeah, so the constraints-led approach is basically, uh, again, you're, you're creating these mechanical constraints, these environmental constraints that that basically a maze. Like if I'm going to teach somebody uh, to run and I don't want them laterally moving off the track, I build walls. Like, you know, you go to a bowling alley. I don't know if you bowling in Ireland. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Wait. Weird not, sport, not, but, not recently, but yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been bowling in, I don't know how long. It's not a place I like to hang out. But, uh, you know, those bowling alleys have those beginner lanes where they have the the bumpers at the, in it. You know, the idea is that the, the person doing that understands the nature of a lane at some point, yes. right? Yeah. By hitting the wall enough times. Well, the constraints-led approach to motor learning is basically the same. You're creating, you're creating a movement maze that you want the person to move through. Uh, by not allowing them to veer off of it, really. And then yeah. over time, you know, as their, as their attention gets better and better at staying on the, the, the objective um, outcome that we want, the brain kind of backward chains the process it needs to go through to get the body to go through that maze mm -hmm. over time. Uh, but that only happened, like, as, 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 as I kind of already explained, there's no such thing as a repetition. So you can't make the same thing happen over and over again. The only thing you can hope for is that something similar will happen. But the only way you can assure that is that your attention doesn't veer off the target in the first place. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Because considering, considering you can't do a repetition, the thing that you're trying to do consistently is based on this other consistent thing. And if you put your attention on what you yourself are trying to make happen you're no longer paying attention to the target and your brain doesn't have the information it needs anymore to sequence the events in the manner we want them to occur um sure so, so what do, i mean this comes goes back to the um the study you talked about with the blacksmith so what are they doing mm -hmm. what are they doing that's different to those that are failing is it an ex what is it an external focus on hitting that object even though the reps are different, they're still hitting the same spot. And then how does that manifest in exercise? Yeah. So, so yeah, so that, you know, and I know it's tough to kind of tie all this stuff Super together. Super complex. Yeah, I get it. It is. But, but um, with regards to the blacksmith, the, the, the skilled blacksmith, the, the difference between the two of them really was that an unskilled blacksmith is probably thinking about how they're trying to hit the target. And the skilled blacksmith is just thinking about the target, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, their, their attention, they 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 miss the target, and their brains like control alt delete. It just goes right back to trying to hit the target over and over again. They're not trying to figure out the process from A to B. They're focused on B and letting their brain figure out how to get from A to B. But it it needs that consistent, repeated reminder of what it's going towards to to figure that out. You know, it's no different from mm -hmm. really any other skill you would learn, but. Um, you know, the, the, again, the unskilled blacksmith would be someone who is, you know, focused on their action in trying to hit the thing, which, of course, is a natural course of events. You always start there. But the idea of automaticity is moving towards a part where that that becomes so efficient in your neural patterns that your brain, you know, your body is not having to waste energy, you know, mm -hmm. operationalizing a task and, and can the resources can be actually put into the task at hand instead of that micro task. 
Um, Got it. So with regards to exercise, um, there's a, there's a few things uh, that I have people focus on externally. Um, and in a, in a way, the more environmental things you can ask somebody to kind of pay attention to simultaneously, the better the, the body will kind of respond. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have your visual sense, your auditory sense, your tactile senses, those types of things. Um, and, you know, vestibular, all these things. And, and uh, you know, if you ask somebody to pay attention to like a spot on the wall, you're occupying the visual sense, right? Um, and then a lot of times I will use, and I'm writing a lot more about this and I have a specific usage of it. I get into another time, but, and I know people have used it over the years, but I kind of tripped over a different way to use it that I had referenced and haven't, you know, to others and haven't heard anyone else using it this way. So, but a metronome mm -hmm. um, with, I think proper auditory feedback. Um, it's giving the person a lot of information. Um, one of the problems with like computer software stuff is that, with regards to the time it takes for the signal to get to your brain and, and come out as physical action, your visual senses are a lot slower than your auditory and your tactile. Um, and so there's more processing that has to occur from the time that you take in that visual thing and, and process it back. So there's a, kind of a lag. Um, and that's why I prefer to have people stare at something that's not moving and instead, you know, use their, their attention on, on, the objective at hand. So the way I ask people to do this during exercises, I'll ask them to stare straight ahead. They'll listen to this metronome. They're trying to time their movement up with this metronome, but what they're paying attention to it, like in the case of a medic's chest press, they'll be in the exercise and kind of with their peripheral vision or just their, their understanding, their awareness, they know they're moving this movement arm back and forth. Okay. They just, you know, that's happening. You can kind of see it in your peripheral vision. I, all I ask them is to pay attention to that going from point A to point B in the timing that I wanted to. All right. But all of this is contingent again upon the trunk stabilization and the setup initially, because if that stays in place and the person's moving in pace with the machine, nothing's happening out of sequence. The, the order of events that we want from a muscular standpoint is happening by evidence of move the, the the rate that the movement arms move but just um, one thing so we, we use the medex chest press as an example right so yeah. you've got the you've given them that that sort of posture tutorial you've yeah. put, got the metronome going to help them with timing you've got that mm -hmm. audio cue and then yeah. you've got that spot on the wall so the visual cue now yeah. let's say they elevate their shoulders yeah. or they you know they don't bend their elbows right away on the mm -hmm. eccentric are you still cueing that? Are you still correcting that as well yeah. when it comes up? Because it's going to so, come yeah. up, right? Even if yeah. the posture is perfect. Is that fair to say? It is. It, yeah. Well, yes and no. Okay. Right. So, so one of the things that, again, in this kind of harkens back to, I think, maybe a redefinition of failure. Mm. The way I, I define failure now, when the way I have my instructors record it and the way I record it is the moment it becomes impossible to maintain this, the, the pace of movement that they're moving at. I stopped the exercise. And the reason for that is because, again, if you if we're understanding biomechanical sequencing and, and the kinetic chain and what's happening and what has to happen to create a, at least to our eyes, a visually consistent speed of movement, that the that is telling us that the sequence of events happening in the body has to be consistent. Because the thing moving this object has to be moving consistently for the object to be moving consistently, right? Mm -hmm. So that has to be our measure. Because the moment that I can't keep up the speed of this object anymore and it slows down, something different has to be happening in my body. It's now a different exercise, in my opinion. Um, I don't have people grind through a repetition anymore just to finish a repetition because I – I don't know. I, I, I don't know what's failing at that point um, mm -hmm. anymore Be, because I don't have the consistency of movement to tell me what's happening with the body anymore. Do you um, see when you, okay, when that consistency of movement drops off, do you see a difference in form invariably at that point? And then that's why yes. you call that failure. And that's, that's my point is, okay. is if somebody is stabilizing their trunk properly and they understand how to move with consistency, 
they kind of get locked into that. And the moment they're unable to maintain that, everything kind of goes all at once. It's not like a gradual mm-hmm. breakdown. Like the inability to keep the shoulders down in a chest press will interrupt the ability for them to keep their pace consistent. So the two things happen simultaneously. A, a, a more skilled person won't let them happen prematurely uh, so that it doesn't wind up affecting the pace of movement. Yeah, And, and that's just the difference between a skill, a, a, a novice and an advanced training mm-hmm. is the, abil- the ability again, to keep their attention on their pace. Because again, the, the motor learning research would tell us that as long as I can keep my attention on that, the body will respond correctly. Okay. Because again, it has to. If that thing's moving consistently, the thing moving it has to be happening with some relative consistency. Because again, there's there's no such thing as a repetition in that sense. Um, but there has to be a relatively consistent path to, mm. you know, kind of hit the same target over and over again, you know, you. in this case, our target's not very hard to hit because the movement arm is doing, doing the work. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not dealing with those variables. So in that way, exercise is a relatively easy skill. Uh, and, and I think if the skills are taught correctly up front, you really get that part out of the way fast. And now you're dealing with people who know how to behave uh, and so you're, you're ne- you now have a controlled experiment to work with, with your clients, because one of the flaws that I think in any, any like exercise methodology study, uh, you know, in physiology studies, you can do histochemical staining and look at muscle fibers and all that cool stuff going on, but in methodology studies, and they statistically fit, you know, figure things out to account for this problem, but it's still a little cheap in my opinion, uh, the one thing that I just never will have trust in with exercise methodology studies is the unknown variable of the person. You know, you're asking them, you're asking a a group of people to do the same task, knowing that each one of those people is not going to be doing the same thing. Um, And, and, and and, and they themselves are not even the same person from one session to the next. And so that, you know, if I'm going to have any, uh, trust in the outcomes uh, metrically in my exercises, I want to be kind of sure that the behavior of the person doing it is pretty much on key every single time they're doing it, or I can't put much trust in what I'm writing down on the chart. Uh, and so my entire kind of quest has been to standardize the behavior of the person doing the exercise so that I can garner something meaningful out of the other uh, variables we're working with. Um, and I think over the years, one of the things that I've seen in, in the hit field that I have slightly been disheartened by is just, uh, I don't want to say disheartened. That's a, that's a, it's a bad word, but, uh, you know, a lot of people got into super slow early on, you know, nineties and stuff and in, in, in Nautilus before that, you know, there wasn't YouTube, uh, there wasn't, there wasn't ways to see how people throughout the country were were training right um everyone read the material and everyone was out on their own doing all this stuff and everyone's assuming we're all reading the same thing and we're all kind of going after the same thing and then youtube came around and all of a sudden for the first time i was able to see studios throughout the country who were purportedly doing what we were doing you know they themselves the instructors themselves filming workouts and i was like oh my god this is Mm -hmm terrible uh there, you know there's, there's such a variance in interpretation here i mean there are you know some people look like they're in a wrestling match with the machine and they're like oh i got i did it 10 10 you know i got a minute 20 time under load time to bump the weight up and you know throwing caution to the wind with regards to their behavior and then rationalizing it saying well you know no one ever can everyone can stay stoic during an exercise and you know and th- th- things like that and and I even pushed the stoic thing for a while, but uh, one of the things that I, again, I kind of learned through the motor learning is, is like was talking about that EMG study is stoicism is a byproduct of your intention during the exercise. It's not something you, again, you should be uh-huh. focusing on making happen because if you are, then you're not paying attention to your yeah, objective. I, anymore. I remember when I used to try and make that an external focus as well, yeah. like the stoic face. And I had a client who just burst out laughing. He found it hilarious. And I was yeah. like, 
you know, if you're laughing, that's definitely not what I intend. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. want you to laugh. What are you focusing on exercise? Well, um, that's one of the things the bite yeah. guard has helped with. Because oh, again, okay. what I was mentioning before is um, the masseter muscles are, are, for the most part, antagonistic to many of the other muscles in the, in the face. And so when, when they have something to contract against, they are, you know, putting the other musculature in the face into length or into relaxation uh, because okay. they're clamping down. And so it takes care of the stoic thing because if somebody's going through and they're wincing, then they're not biting. So <laughs> as long yeah. as they're biting, they can't wince. It's like trying to pat your head and rub your chest at the same time. You're doing one or the other. Uh, and so the, the bite guard is taking care of a lot of that behavior side of things because it's also kind of puts the head and neck in a position that's a lot more stable. Uh, and so you, I just watch people behave better in that way. So mm -hmm. my entire point is if I can stick something in someone's mouth and say bite, and now I look at them and I don't have to tell them to keep their head still anymore. I, I have a, a much better uh, assurance that what I'm seeing from one workout to the next is consistent enough that these numbers on my chart mean something again. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of circles back to how we started this is that this is, this is what my clients are seeing now. This is what they're excited by. I now have such consistent behavior with people that I can say, go after this number and I can rest assured that they're not going to misbehave in doing it. And so it's now, a correct carrot on a stick that actually drives their motivation to exert more. Uh, and they're finding that they're capable of way more than they thought because they're no longer chasing this mirage called failure. Um, they're chasing some objective that I've given them based on a previous workout, knowing that I can almost predict it because their behavior is so consistent. Well, like a number of repetitions or a time and yep. load, you're giving them that objective. Yep. That's so fascinating. It's almost like you've come full circle. Absolutely. The objective uh, of exercise. Yeah. Look at that. I bet yeah, some people I'll, are not very happy with you, Al. <laughs> no, probably not. No. Um, well, I don't use time under load anymore because it, it depends on repetition speed uh, mm -hmm. almost completely, you know, to some degree. Um, yeah. Like the time under load you will get between uh, a 10 second repetition and a seven second repetition isn't that different yeah uh, I, yeah the time under load you will see between a seven second repetition and a five second one is gigantic the time under load you'll see between a five second repetition and a three second one gets even greater so there's a there's a problem with time under load obviously Perhaps a cleaner, pointed right? this out before yeah i just don't like to use it as a measure for that reason alone i mean being that repetitions are just a step function of time anyway um you know, as we're changing the time of a repetition, we, we want to use the more stem, simple step function to track it, in my opinion. Uh, and again, just numerically, it's it's much easier for people to focus on a simplified step function than it is to ask them to focus on time. Um, uh, that's something we can get into another time. That no, I, this is so fascinating. Stuff, um, but, yeah, it's... Oh, I forgot what I was going to ask you there, but no, it's sure. it's it makes a lot of sense to me what you're saying, and it's it's mm. kind of what we're doing. Much of what you say, there's a lot we're not, which I am inspired by, and thinking about how we can add that into our process. But yeah. um, you know, tracking the reps and mm. telling the client, hey, you know what? Last time you achieved X, this time I want you to yeah. focus on achieving this is something which a lot of our colleagues don't agree with, but we've been doing, and I know a number of other studios yeah. are doing. So it's. It's there's a bit of a mixed view that's, on that in our, in our industry. That's, yeah, that's kind of where I've really diverged from people. No, it's not that I've diverged. It's just that I, I, I saw that maybe we're going about it the wrong way. Like we were telling people again, we don't like to focus. We don't like to use numbers to hang out there to, to get people to chase because we're afraid of the behavior it was going to induce. That's yeah, it. Exactly. We're, we're afraid that 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 cue that instruction is going to cause them to misbehave. My point yeah. is, well, if you get them to behave, it won't. And instead, if you get them to behave, they fix their behavior, that number is just going to drive them harder. Um, that number is now going to be this conceptual construct in their head that's going to give their nervous system the directive that we're asking it to. Yeah. Um, we're programming into the nervous system an objective now that it now can kind of just, from a bottoms up, process figure itself out 
and reach. And so I'm able to manipulate things. And this is a, a longer discussion um, in such a way that I've been able to keep a lot of people's, you know, stuff moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, that's a lot of stuff I'm writing now. And I don't want to say too much of that because I'm just kind of experimenting with it. And I don't yes, fine. want to put it. Which you know what I'd love for... to do is because this sure. has been really eye-opening for me and uh, for, for quite exciting actually. Yeah. And I'd love to talk about this in a particular example. You know, the yeah. chest press we've been talking about quite a bit on this podcast. Maybe we just yeah. use the chest press. And just to go from start to finish, if you don't mind. So hmm. you, you earlier you started talking about setup and you said you had the primary and then the sub yep. goal or something like that could you just 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 so the listeners mm -hmm. can really grasp what you're saying in a specific yep. example like on a chest press and then they can maybe try and implement this themselves can you walk us through that from start to finish yeah so let, let me go back and describe what i called the uh primary postural task yep. and the super postural task and and give you uh, yeah rehash analogy. it that's fine yeah, yeah. For, give you a slight analogy that they use, and uh, I read in one of these motor uh, motor learning book. It wasn't a study, but it was it was an example. Say you have a, a roller skating waitress, right? <laughs> uh, she's got a tray of whatever. She's trying to balance, and she's on roller skates. The roller skating would be considered the primary postural task. That's the primary thing she's doing. The super postural task is task that you're you're applying on top of that primary one, the, the holding of the tray. Now, as any waiter or, or server knows, you don't look at the tray or the ground or anything else except the horizon when you're walking with the tray. It's like or when you're you, driving a car, you should look down the road ahead. Yeah, you don't look at the wheel yeah. or the gas pedal. You're, you're, you're broadly yeah. paying attention to you, the ecology of the situation and letting your nervous system respond in time once you have an understanding of the various operations, right? And that's that's basically what we're doing in an exercise when we set somebody's body up where we want it. We're basically teaching them all the moving parts and what to move and what not to move. And then we're driving the car, which is the machine mm. in that point. But um, in the case of the roller skating waitress, what they show is, is by focusing on the correct objective of balancing the super postural task, the tray, the postural task automatically gets better. It has to. <laughs> mm. or you can't do the super postural one. So it's a, it's a bottoms up process in the sense that by putting my attention on this finer thing, the primary thing gets better. Um, and so as long as we teach somebody in an exercise where to put their head and neck and their spine and all of this, and we say, okay, now keep this here. And now I want you to move this from eight. Their attention being, because they've set themselves up correctly, their attention being on this other external objective the primary postural one will stay where it's supposed to. Um, as long as, again, our external objective is on keeping the, the speed of this object consistent, so to speak, depending, it depends, I guess, on what you're asking the person to do with an exercise. But in, in my case, it's, I like people to focus on the consistency of the pace of, of the movement on. Uh, yeah. is, is, just, just a yeah. side note, I was a terrible sure. waiter. And I once spilled an entire <laughs> bottle of red wine all over this lady. It was a very posh restaurant, like a silver service restaurant. I worked yeah. uh, like over 10 years ago, like 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I pretty much ruined her day. And she still tipped me strangely because I think yeah. I dealt with it well. But yeah, I was the worst waiter the world has ever seen now. So yeah, thank God I didn't stay in that. Well, actually I was, I think I was sacked. Yeah, I was, I was sacked. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. one of the other interesting things is, so we talk about, we talk about direct muscular loading a lot. You know, that's the, that's the objective we consider to be one of our primary objectives of an exercise mm -hmm. is to, to do an exercise in such a way that we're loading a particular set of structures and we don't want to unnecessarily load structures that aren't responsible for those joint actions. You know, it's kind of the idea behind an exercise or else why would you do one? Um, sure. But again, we've always approached it by something that's something we need to mediate. All right. But in any type of athletic skill, um, by definition, the movement becomes more efficient and safer when the body moves smoother and learns to use the larger structures to accomplish the biomechanical task. Injury happens when that movement gets unsmooth and now these smaller structures are forced to 
be loaded in a way and do things that they're not supposed to do. Um, and so the smoother a task becomes, the more direct the muscular loading is becoming. It has to, or else it gunks up the speed of the joint. Um, so this will tick some people off, but to some degree, the faster you move, the more direct the muscular loading is. It has to be, um, because for a joint to move faster, the muscles surrounding the primary one responsible for the movement of the joint have to be more relaxed or the speed can't pick up. <laughs> so obviously you're dealing with other physics involved there, which is why you wouldn't want to go that fast. Um, Cause that's throwing another variable into the equation, but I'm saying yeah. in theory, the, the more, the quicker a muscular contraction is, the more direct it is. Um, it, again, it has to be <laughs> or else, or else joint movement would be inhibited. Yeah. Um, and so putting your attention on the external task kind of drives the body in that way. Um, whereas when you're kind of internally focused on how you're exerting, you're again, you're kind of gunking up the, mm -hmm. the, the movement at the joint because you're kind of basically micromanaging the exercise. So uh, it's called it's called just the principle of self-organization in motor learning. Again, basically, by putting your attention on what you're doing, you're letting the body figure out the, the, the path it needs to take to, to, to reach the end objective. Yeah. And again, I think what my, a lot of people will get confused with what, with what I'm saying is with an exercise, if we designed it correctly and we've set the body up correctly and we understand the arc that we want either the, the implement to move through, uh, either a machine or a free weight or whatever, and we, we are sure we're moving in that arc. We, we don't have to break the exercise down any more than that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to think about anything else because that arc is taking care of yeah. the, the musculature involved. So I'm not saying, you know, aggressively try to attack the machine or wiggle it around just to finish a repetition. I'm, there's a context. I'm talking about trying to keep the swing of the movement at a consistent pace until it's unable to do so. The moment that you can't do that, you're now doing something different. If you continue past that, yeah. it's not the same exercise anymore. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I know I've, I've read here and there, uh, by the way, for your listeners, this is a great book. Uh, it's on Kindle uh, that this guy does a great job, in my opinion, of compiling a lot of the research on hypertrophy. I think the book's just called Hypertrophy uh, by Chris Beardsley. He's oh, a yeah. medium page. He does some yeah, he's interesting, like some interesting infographics and stuff like that with regards to the, the process of things. But, yep. you know, we know that most of the motor units that are going to be recruited during an exercise are recruited about 80% of the way to what is considered to be mechanical failure in, in the literature, you know? So I'm just not sure like all the grinding that you see in traditional hit of trying to dig out that last final repetition. I'm just not sure what it's doing besides mm -hmm just making your body go into a wrestling match that it's going to have to recover from. Uh, it's clear to me that, you know, once you get into an exercise, there's a consistency of movement up to a certain point when you start to see strain and struggle, right? Mm -hmm. A skilled person will be able to hold that off as long as possible while maintaining the speed of the object. Again, that's what defines the skilled exerciser from a non-skilled one in this, this point. But, even for that person, they will reach a point where their behavior is going to have to change to continue to affect movement of the object. And at that point, it doesn't make sense to me to do the exercise anymore. You've now changed the exercise. Because yeah. again, given the fact that there's no such thing as a repetition, we're using this visual marker of the machine moving at a consistent pace to grossly track what we're doing. And if at that level, it's now grossly different than it was before, we can rest assured that we're not even doing close to the same thing we were doing before considering what we were doing before wasn't even the same from one rep to the next. So, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how I, the, one of the major things I've changed is, is not having people kind of, I have them move along with the pace I'm moving. If they have to grind through to finish a repetition, it, it, there's an obvious change in the way that's happening. And so I, I don't see much of a point in doing that. Uh, and it's, I think greatly assisted my client's recovery and their ability to keep progression going, or to at least make it 
the record keeping consistent enough that it lets me see get an accurate picture of what uh, what's happening. What if in the I'm just thinking like maybe for beginner clients and maybe even some novice clients mm-hmm. maybe this is something we're doing wrong but I'm just curious. Sure. What if that grinding at the end? How do I put this? Um, mm-hmm. What if that's a result of discomfort versus mm-hmm. actually? being at you know muscular failure right and it's so it's it they, they, therefore if you see the exercise then you might be short changing that's my only concern so oh, here's here's, here, here's you know something that's kind of something to ponder for people is mm-hmm. is again i mentioned earlier we don't you know there's a lot of things that are causing mechanical failure but one of those again as i mentioned with the whole signature time under load thing is simply a person's attention. As I've already mentioned, okay. the recruitment of, of a biomechanical sequence of events is contingent upon where the person's at, what the person's attending to. So a behavioral change in an exercise is evidence that their attention is shifted to something different. Um, and so to a large degree- it's focused on ability, the discomfort. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. moment, right, I tell people this is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be there, but it's in the periphery. It's a side effect of the exercise. You don't have to pay attention to it. <laughs> uh, it you know, it, you it's know, a just big like ask though, right? Because even yeah. even someone like myself, and obviously I'm nowhere near the level of yourself, Al. Like I wouldn't even yeah. put myself in the same category. Um, you know, when I'm doing a, oh, in, in fact, today, right before we spoke, I had a workout. So I'm quite impressed with uh, my ability to keep up with this conversation so far. Um, but <laughs> but, uh, but I did a wall sit and mm-hmm. a wall sit, you know, listeners will know is very uncomfortable exercise. And yeah. uh, I hit the deck probably easily 30, 40 seconds before actual, you know, muscle failure. And yeah. uh, so, you know, even myself, someone who's pretty experienced, been at this for 10 years, yeah, but, but over that, uh, it, you know, I, I still struggle. So, just, so that's mm-hmm. and you, discomfort and, and can that, be a real thing. Yeah, and that's one of the the kind of one of the, the problems with the concept of failure. Is, mm-hmm. Again, because like I've already explained, you know, based on my understanding of a lot of this motor learning literature on a, on attention and behavioral control and things like that. Again, the way the body responds in a biomechanical sequencing of events is again, contingent upon what you're paying attention to. So mm. as that changes, so is what's going to happen com- that, that comes after that. So if you're doing a wall sit, it's incredibly uncomfortable. How, how do you standardize where you're losing your attention? Uh, you know, so I should focus on a clock or a time the- or something like that. That's what I should right. probably focus on, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Sorry, I mean, I'm, cut, I'm interjecting there. Yeah. He, he, well, you're going in the right direction. We need yeah. those objective measures to give the person a context for what they're attending to and how long Mm. they have to attend to it. Because again, if if you throw failure out there in the wind and say, I just want you to go to failure. Well, they can only attend to that for so long before they can't pull off all the other things that they're trying to ignore. And that's why the discomfort takes over and makes most people stop because they can't pay attention any longer. And so what comes rushing in is, all the discomfort they're under. But if you say to somebody, I want you to do this number of repetitions at, you know, with these other, with these other constraints in mind, like your, your pace and all this, these are the things I want you to attend to. And this is how long I want you to attend to it. Most people will go, okay. And they'll do it. <laughs> if you say go to failure, they'll be like, oh, all right. Yeah. How long do I have to do that? So amorphous for, for people as well. Yeah. yeah. This it's, is it's, so interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, the and it, it's it's all based on our conceptual construction of you know how our again our brains are one of our survival tools we create conceptual constructs as a survival tool i mean that's how human beings survive in the world and so much of how we operate is contingent upon what it is we're paying attention to it's how the body again it's a responder to an ecology we're not just isolated organisms who are trying to like control our environment around us. It's the other way around. (laughs) Uh, And as long as we're attending to things correctly surrounding us, our body will respond correctly. And that's kind of, I think maybe the. That's really profound culmination of a lot of this, this motor learning stuff. 
I'll let up on. So Al, I would love, I know I already asked you this and we went on another yeah. tangent, but it was in a really good one, like the best tangent yet, for sure. Yeah. But we've got another sort of 29 minutes here. And what I'd love to do sure. is just walk through that chest press. So Medex chest press, yeah. you've got a new client. I'd love mm-hmm. to hear how you do it. And I guess whilst describing how you how you integrate what we've been talking about today in that process so we, so how you sure. introduce someone to the machine mm-hmm. set them up talk about the fo- the primary focus etc cetera, etc cetera, and actually do the exercise could you just walk us through that and whatever level of resolution you you want and i'll just sure. maybe dive in as we go yeah sure so um w- one of the things i and i will talk about this a little bit so the first thing i always address again is is the way i want them to hold their trunk in an exercise Right. Um, And that's kind of something I will teach outside of any exercise. Mm. So I'll teach somebody how to stand first. And and this sounds a little crazy, but like there is a proper way to stand. You do want to stand with your legs in the ground, your hips kind of externally rotated, which will, you know, tilt your pelvis in a correct position. And then uh, I got this from that uh, guy who wrote Becoming a Supple Leopard, uh, Kelly Starrett. Yeah. He's got a great couple chapters on trunk organization. Um, you have you have become very open minded. I really like. It. Oh, I, I read everything. Yeah, uh, good for you. Good no, for you. I don't. Doesn't mean you have I to accept to it all, does it? I'm sure well, there's a plenty in that you biases. disagreed with. Yeah, yeah. I just like to read. I mean, I try not to yeah. sit there and talk to myself while I'm reading. I just like to read stuff and stuff yeah. that makes sense to me. I integrate stuff that doesn't. I don't. I don't. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I, I like that he did, uh, and again, I, this is a talk for another time. I've been a uh, Zen meditator for about 20 years yeah. and, and Zen posture is pod, insanely yeah. important. As a matter of fact, um, in the tradition that I've, I've sat in, they, they don't teach you how to meditate. They, they show you the posture to sit in and they say, hold still till the bell rings. And that's all the instruction you get. <laughs> um, but um, posture is very important. Suffice it to say, uh, because the idea is that there is not a difference between the physical and the mental, right? You know, your, your mental processes are basically a result of what you're doing with yourself physically. And so, you know, to set somebody up in an exercise, posture has a profound effect on their ability to pay attention. You know, it's, it doesn't take a genius to realize that if you're slumped and you're like this, you're probably, you're probably spaced out and all over the place. Yeah, um, and when you, when you have good posture and you stand up with your shoulders yeah. back and chest up, doesn't it increase like serotonin and absolutely. all these other yeah. hormones? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Absolutely. All that stuff is true. You know, that's not just, uh, I know it's a nice thing to say, right? I'm thinking of Stay Jordan there. Peterson and the lobsters. I don't know if yeah. you've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's another, there's a book. Uh, I couldn't get through the rest of the book. It was too cheesy and self help but, uh, but there was a, there was a book called presence. Uh, Amy Cuddy. She's a, I think a, behavioral psychologist at uh, mm-hmm. Harvard. Uh, she did a TED talk years ago. It's great. You can find it. Uh, you don't have to buy the book. Just watch her TED talk and <laughs> buy her book. Sorry. Uh, link, no, it's fine. <laughs> no, no, be, 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 be authentic. I'll, I'll link all this up in the show notes anyway. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. no. I, 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 I want, I want people to buy her book. It's, it's a good book. It's just, it, you know, I didn't, just didn't, I didn't need to read the whole thing. Uh, the, 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 uh, you know, she talks a lot about, postures and what they mean socially and, and physiologically and things like that. And, you know, a lot of it sounds like a lot of pokem or whatever, but it's not, you know, when you understand physiology of the body, it makes sense. You organize yourself in a certain position. You're giving your, you're giving your uh, nervous system a particular uh, imperative basically, and how it needs to operate to maintain that. And that affects your attention. So, uh, I always ask somebody to kind of basically take their bladed hand, put it on their xiphoid process, and then right below their navel, and that the the two lines created should be parallel with one another. So we don't want them extended, like so they shouldn't be vastly separated, and they shouldn't be crunched together. All right, they should kind of okay. stuck and stable. Uh, and what that does is it, it will not only does it keep the trunk fixed, but it allows the scapula to organize itself around the trunk properly. So what you don't see as much of, or any of, if if they maintain it during a chest press, is the rounding forward of the shoulders. Because again, for that to happen, the central column has to go first. As long as that stays in place, for the most part, as long as the velocity of the object is kept consistent, the scapula will move around how it's supposed to. Um, 
you won't see that rounding forward of the shoulders because that will require a curvature in the thoracic spine, which means you lost your spinal position. Yeah, so, of course. As long as that's maintained, I emphasize to people, that's number one. So you're doing this, out, you're not on the machine right now. You're just standing there explaining this, yep. then walking them through it. Love it. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. And I, I mean, once they, they master that, I go, good. Mirror that on every exercise. And the moment I see you lose it for these first few workouts, that's where we're stopping. Uh, and I'm. It's sometimes I might stop them, tell them what they did, and then have them continue just for rehearsal purposes so they understand mm -hmm. turn around all of that stuff. I don't want to just you know, if they screw it up after the first one and all and just call it a day on them. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to make it instructive, you know, I, I, I make it blunt, but, but instructively. So it's not punishment in it, but anyway. Sure. Uh, um, so I'll have them do that first. And in the case of the medic chest press, um, you know, I'm not going to go into detail about proper setup in the machine because you know that's fine. Know yeah, so you're, so you're setting up the seat, the, the seat yeah. back. You're gapping yeah. it appropriately. Setting, yeah. Go ahead. One there, of yeah. the things that I've done differently um, that I that I know I might get some kickback on from people is you know if you look at a lot of the the medics equipment and this could just be for convenience, but most of the back pads are absolutely flat. But if you look at the infographic that comes on the shields. The, the character in them is always right against the back pad. And I can't help but think that has something to do with the design of the machine as well. You know, you, you draw a character like that on a graphic. That's kind of probably how you meant for it to look. So, yeah. um, you know, you have this person in this picture with this ideal posture. My point is not that everybody's going to have that. Most people won't, but you should work towards it. Um, and, and I, Static posture assessment, what they call a wall test, where you put your back against the wall, your feet about, I don't know, a foot away from the wall, your butt, your upper back, and your head go against the wall, and you're testing the curvature of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spines. There's there's you know, kind of a pass and a fail, but basically, someone with a normal spinal curvature, you should be able to stick their hand, they should be able to stick their hand behind them and get their middle knuckles about in alignment with their spine. So they should only be able to get their, their hand about halfway uh, through uh, mm. the, 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 the space between their back and the wall, right? Any more than that, and they have too much lordosis, any less, uh, and, and they're probably- Lordosis is the too much curvature in the lumbar, right? Yes. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I still have that. I think from too yeah. much gaming when I was a kid and poor posture and the, and- Probably not. I know I'm just going off course here. Yeah. Uh, probably not addressing that as well as I could be in my strength training. I think it's mild, but I still think I have some of that. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, and that that's another topic for another day. But that uh, yeah. a lot of that has to do with the, you know, the the iliopsoas complex and its position. Your it's pulling your pelvis and all of that. But okay. Um, so basically, this wall test is testing somebody's, you know degree of spinal curvatures along the way. And I try to set the exercise up for the most part. The, the Medex chest press I have has a retrofitted back pad where it's, it's angled a little bit more backwards. Ah. And so I found that in order for the mechanics of that machine to, to fit up with a person properly, they need to be as close, their head needs to be as close to the back pad as possible without compromising proper head and neck position. So what I do is I have them go as far back as they can. Then I pad the head mm. to where I want it. And this is a major. Or just with a, hang on with like a, a pillow or something like yes. that. Or yeah. Got it. Some object, something like a yoga block or anything really, I guess. Yeah. Now yeah. the concern, and I know people have this concern is that the person as they fatigue will start to crane their head and neck into this thing. I've, I, I know some okay. people use head and neck pillows and I, I've heard arguments against it because when you put something behind somebody's head, they want to push. Or they want to, but you can also shut that off um, for the most part. Uh, and this is kind of a cue you can use to help people prevent uh, scapular elevation or, you know, the, the, the upper trapezius from becoming involved is simply retracting your chin. Like you're making a double chin, uh, you know, puts, puts that musculature into um, uh, passive insufficiency. So you can't, as active, I don't know, one of the two, uh, <laughs> you, you can't, uh, it, it, it makes it harder to shrug. And again, um, 
bringing the chin in contracts a, a deep neck flexor muscle called your longus coli, which actually kind of tracks the cervical spine apart a little bit. So again, it's one of those mechanisms that stiffens your spine up again, which is a good thing. And because the chin is tucked in and they maintain that, if there's a pad behind their head, they're not going to crane back into it because they have to lift their chin to do that. So as long as their chin's back here, they're not going to be pushing into the pad in a way that would hurt their neck or cause ancillary muscular involvement in the shoulder girdle. So you're kind of shutting all of that off. And now their scapula and the back of their shoulders are as close to the back pad as possible, which is why you don't see forward shoulder rounding on a lying bench press because you're, you're, you're supine gravity is forcing your shoulders into the back pad. That doesn't happen on the medics chest press with a lot of people because of how rounded a lot of people's spines are. We always want their head and neck in neutral wherever they are, which means if somebody has got a really hyphotic upper back, their head and neck neutral position is like, like this. Well, yeah, yeah. they're never going to be able to do that exercise correctly then because yeah. they're not positioned in a way that's moving congruently with the movement on them. Yeah. So I have someone in mind who we have this problem with, and this yeah. could be the solution. This podcast really could be the solution to it for this particular client. And it'd be difficult yeah. without kind of showing you exactly what I mean by a lot of these things. But uh, no, no, I, quite, I found, you were good at articulating it. It's quite vivid for me, at least, I think. Oh, uh, thanks. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, you're doing a great uh, job. But uh, the, uh, the MedX chest press I have, kind of assist in that way a little bit because again it, it it's laid back a little bit more mm -hmm. than the stock version uh which make, makes the mechanics of the machine a little more god i do anything to come and train at your facility i would pay good money al <laughs> to go over to your facility and be trained by yourself one day one of these days go on so well, just fantasizing yeah. over here <laughs> you'd also have to check out rob too if you came here uh, oh 100 percent. oh yeah i mean it's one of my goals and it's difficult because i got a very young family who really need me right now but yeah. um I and you know what that's all about, um, but it's it's one of my goals to to definitely tour around the states and meet all of you guys and yeah. just learn as much as I can and and do that on a regular basis, one hundred percent. I I cannot wait to be able to do that. Well, Nicole and I'd love to have you. So oh, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. But um, yeah, so the the the, the position of the the back pad on the medics chest press makes it significantly easier. Uh, I think for people to keep their shoulders. No, because again, it's more horizontal at that point. Um, so that the mechanics of that make it a little bit closer to a lying bench press, which yeah, you know, I see puts you in that position. Yeah. Uh, so just the vector of force, uh, the force vector makes it a little bit better for the shoulder in that way. But have, having said that, even the stock version, the closer you can get somebody to basically recreating the wall test uh, with their, their posture on that back pad, the better position they're going to be to take advantage, full advantage of the mechanics of the machine is, is, is my point. Mm -hmm. um, even in a leg press, you know, the, the more organized we can keep somebody's spine from head to pelvis, um, the better set up their pelvis is going to be to act on the thighs correctly to move the movement. Of them. So it's just a quick question in terms of the, the legs. I noticed this, the odd client will want to just like, and I think I don't know if this is totally incorrect, We'll want yeah. to put their legs either side rather than mm -hmm. uh, parallel in front. Yeah. They want mm -hmm. to almost. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like yeah. they're, they're they're like they're like doing an I don't know how to explain it. Like they're, they're just legs are apart. With a lot of people's pelvic structures. Because to um, me, I'm like that looks really uncomfortable because I like to have my legs, you know, parallel and directly in front with yeah. with my uh, knee joint over the front of the pad. Now, is that is that should we be coaching that rather than the legs apart? Does it matter? Uh, it or is could. it personal preference? Okay. It, it's not personal preference as much as it is the, the structure of that person's pelvis. There's a, there's, you know, a lot of yeah. people have, have uh, pelvises that are structured a little bit differently. Um, and some people have what's called uh, FAI, which is femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. Okay. And it's just where the, the femur kind of crashes into the front of the pelvis because of the space there or how anteriorly the pelt the femur is positioned in the in the socket uh and there's a lot of things to consider and sometimes with the 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 structure of some people's pelvis uh some abduction and external rotation of the thigh clears the hip 
uh, and allows them to actually access the range of motion in their hip. Whereas if you had their feet parallel and their legs parallel, they may get some impingement and not, Got it. you know, but, but then you, sometimes you're, you're looking at other things that could be corrected and then have them put in a more ideal position, which is a talk, talk for another day. But sure. yeah. um, my point is many rabbit holes. You, you kind of do have to look at the, I mean, while we do have standards, we, we, we put some, we, you know, we're striving for in an exercise. Yeah. I would say in a leg press, the closer you can get the feet and the legs to being parallel, the better. Um, you will have individuals who have structures that will force you to diverge from that. And so you meant chest press, right? You said leg press. You meant chest press. Yeah, I meant chest. Yeah. Well, leg obviously press the too, same is for using, leg press too, right? You were using the leg press as an example, so I was still talking about the. Pelvis. No, I was using a chest yeah. press. I was using a chest press. You were. Did yeah, you sorry. Leg press? No. No, no. I promise you, because I, I. Because what I'm trying to explain is that you. you're sitting on the chest press and some people have their thighs like out like this ah, and then pads ah, here. Okay. So their thighs are apart. I don't know Sorry. why. My, my alignment to leg press. When you're you fine. That, We've been Sorry. talking for a while. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, no. If somebody's thighs move during a chest press, uh, they're again, they're paying attention to something else. So like I, I will, I, I put a stool in front of them and with yep. this, with, with the angle, the back pad I have, I prefer to have their feet on the top of the stool. So their hips are, basically at a right Got angle. It. Um, and I'll put their feet in a position where it's comfortable, but I don't want to see their thighs waving back and forth. Um, yeah. And that's not something, again, I instruct out. And what I mean by that yeah. is it's not something that happens if they're paying attention correctly to the other things involved. Yeah. But what I mean is, is it a problem if they don't move back and forth, but let's say they start in that position where the thighs are out on a chest press oh. and then they stay in that. Is that problematic? Yeah. I don't, um, only, only if it affects their ability to keep their pelvis in position, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because to, I guess to some degree, um, well, the more you abduct the, uh, the thighs, the more of an anterior pelvic tilt you're going to get. Um, okay. so in that some instances that may yeah. assist some people who have a hard time maintaining, okay. uh, pelvic positioning, that may be okay. a potential solution for some, but in general, I, I I wouldn't stray away from just keeping them straight ahead if got it if at all possible. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that was so good. So okay, so we've talked about um, positioning in the chest mm. press. You, you talk about your one specifically with a retrofitted back pad, and yeah. that's that's really clear to me. And it, I think yeah, you've done a great job getting up to this point. So so then I guess we're beginning the exercise, right? So what are you mm. saying? Okay, what are you saying to the client right before they do their first rep? What are the cues? What are the instructions on the on the medex chest press just to keep it simple, ish? Um, well, after after making sure I have their hand placement correct, and that I make sure that they understand that the elbow is supposed to stay directly behind the wrist, which is supposed to stay directly behind the hand, which is positioning the hand in such a way that when you push on the movement arm, the force vector is going, you know, in the in a direct correction that your body's producing against the movement arm. And that for the most part, if you have the setup correct, will also take care of shoulder positioning and everything else. Um, if you watch people and their elbows are winging up and down as they're going through the exercise, um, a lot of that can be connect corrected by making sure that they don't ever let their wrist move. Um, because if their wrist is in position, their elbow will stay behind their wrist and they'll just push back and forth on the thing instead of trying to wiggle around with it as they move. So I make sure that's in position. And then, you know, once they understand their, their, their trunk set up and they have all that in position they're, you know, I, I say, roll your shoulders down and back. And I want you to act almost as though you are pushing the back pad away from the handles instead of the handles away from the back pad. Uh, and that, that thought usually will uh, initiate a push where they are forced to push back a little bit first, which then positions the shoulders against the back pad. Love that. Uh, so they initiate that and I say, good, keep that for the rest of the exercise. And then from there, I, you know, I have this metronome on and I have a sequence so that it will start on a certain beep. And when they hear that beep, all I say is I want you to stare straight ahead at this spot that I set out in front of them. And with your peripheral vision, I want you to time your movement so that the movement arm goes from this beep to this beep and back. Um, 
And again, there's more detailed instruction to that, but that has to do with how I teach the metronome. What movement is speed does that typically result in? Uh, well, that's something I'm playing around with a lot too. Okay. Uh, but I, I think uh, like a three, three, four, four cadence seems to be mm -hmm. about best for most things, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, that's something else I can get into another day, but yeah, uh, I, I've seen some interesting things by changing speeds around. Uh, and what I'm again, what I'm always looking for is automaticity. I'm looking for the speed of motion. Um, so again, I'm looking for uniform movement for the most part. And so I, I'm when I think of ideal speed, I'm not thinking in terms of like what the speed has effect it has on the body necessarily, but what's the speed that for most people they'll almost intuitively move at if everything else is set up correctly. Um, because that tells me something about, about this in general. Uh, and one of the things I found is that people have the easiest time complying to their consistency, the speed when it's at three, three or four, four. Okay. I don't know why I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah, uh, fine. if I've changed speeds, any, you know, five, five, six, six, I see them be less accurate. I'll put it mm -hmm. that way. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're not hitting hitting their timing as well as often. So that's just an observation. Um, so one, one thing you haven't said yet is you haven't said about the carrot. So we haven't given them the carrot yet, or are you getting to that? So the, the carrot, the carrot really is, is the, the repetition count to some degree. Right? Yeah. But there's a goal number, right? Yeah. Is there? Well, yeah. It, again, it depends on, 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 the protocol that I'm having them use. And this, this Got is a it. topic for another day, but I, I have been messing around with alternating between some single set stuff and some cluster set style training with people. So the objective number will change based on what yeah. protocol I'm using. Uh, but I'm cycling the two back and forth, seeing how they affect one or the other. And I'm seeing a lot of interesting stuff. And ironically for single set training with, you know, at three, three, I'm pretty much back at Arthur's <laughs> Ellington Darden's eight, like to, eight 12, to 12. Six. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, what would you say? Would you say if it's, if it's their first time on the chest press, would you say, I want you to try and achieve at least eight repetitions. And then obviously if, if further yeah. down the line, they got nine, you'd say, mm -hmm. look, I want you to try and get at least 10 today. Right. Yes. Yeah. That would be the kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Now, again, this is all set up contextually. So they understand that if they break a, B and C, then they don't get credit for this. Uh, and so the way I had the metronome set up, there's a timing aspect to it. So I tell them if, if you're, if you are early or late, I'm not, you're not gonna get credit for it. So the repetition has a context here. Um, I'm, I'm strict, but at the same time at three, three and four, four, if somebody misses a repetition by a second, you're not talking about a very gross discrepancy. Uh, yes. whereas, yes. you know, with super slow, we were telling people anything between eight and 12 was acceptable. And that's four seconds. That's a huge, yeah. uh, a lot can happen in four seconds. Yeah. Uh, so that I just found that ironic because an eight second repetition and a 12 second repetition are not even close to being the same thing. So we were telling people that range was acceptable. Um, so having said that, you know, I have people strive for this cadence and for the most part, they're on, on cue. But if they miss it by a second, I'm not going to stop the exercise and say, hey, do you get credit for that one? As long as it's a hiccup within the mm -hmm. set, you know, um, be because you can also account for hiccups <laughs> at yeah. some point. Uh, and so that becomes part of the standardization. So, And um, in terms of a metronome, are you just using an app on the phone? Because I know there's loads of metronome apps on the phone software. Uh, yeah, I have I have an I have a metronome app hooked up to a Bluetooth speaker Got in my it. studio. Nice uh, and loud. And I do I do experiment with the speed and the and and which exercise I'm, I'm using it on, which I, I I usually only apply to myself when I'm in the studio by myself. Um, obviously, I don't I'm not going to start changing metronome speeds on people if I have a studio full of <laughs> yeah. clients. Uh, they get rather confused, yes. but. Uh, no, for the for the most part, um, it's just a it's a metronome app uh, oh. that I use the the time signatures on to create the cadence I want. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I know uh, Richard, if you're listening, Richard Chartrand, I know you're a huge fan of metronomes. People can go check out his workouts on YouTube. Yeah. I don't know what his channel is. It's either Richard Chartrand or Sustainable Success, but we'll link yeah. it up in the show notes because I think he demonstrates the metronome use uh, use case quite well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm writing ahead. part of my books about it. Um, you know, I'm kind of titling it this chapter called the metronome method. And it's not just about exercise. I, it can, it can be applied to the learning of any really physical skill, uh, in a way, but there's a lot of research on metronomes and, and learning disabilities. Um, there's an entire program called interactive metronome used for kids with cognitive disorders. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, auditory feedback really helps process things uh, interesting a lot more efficiency so yeah. yeah so i think is that is that the a completed overview of how you would coach the the, the chess press is that i mean just conscious of time is there anything else you want to add yeah um no for the for most part that's it um except that i really harp on the timing of the metronome with the turnarounds that's really the skill that they're really working on up front and yep. learning to connect it so that really we're forming a continuous loop of movement. I, I often give the analogy of running around a track. Um, our, our goal here, although you know it's technically not possible, but the, the goal is to run around the track at a consistent pace the whole way around. I go, you know, when you're running around a track, you know, and you're racing, you don't get credit if you, if you cut across midfield to go to the other side, you gotta go all the way around the track. Uh, so the same thing applies here. But what you're trying to do is time up your, your, you know, you getting to one end of the track or the other at the same time that you're hearing, sorry, <laughs> you're metronome fine. beat. Yeah. Um, well, that I've been here two hours and it turned off. That's pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> you've uh, done great. Yeah. So we're just trying to time up those two events basically. Uh, yep. And when somebody kind of gets into a rhythm and, and kind of physically comprehends that speed, you've relieved them of that duty. They've relieved themselves of that duty. And now everything goes towards their effort and just in maintaining that pace, yeah. um, which is a lot different than the effort that has to go into straining and struggling mm -hmm. against the load. And so one of the, again, the analogies I use is this is more like running harder than it is trying to move a weight. And if you, if you look at how people how you react to different physical activities. If you are trying to break inertia and move a really heavy object off the ground, your guttural instinct is the Valsalva maneuver. You globally tense everything in order to mechanically make your body efficient to move this object from A to B. There's really no time consideration other than just move the thing. But when you're performing an event like running, there's a time consideration and the effort required is going in towards increasing a certain sequence of events in your body so that they are that that speed of motion is maintained. And so when you watch a sprinter run, you don't see tension in their face because they don't have time for that. Uh, their nervous system doesn't have time to start letting tension spread that way. It, it's it's immediately directed into the areas that are responsible for moving the organism. So that's kind of one of those situations where the stoicism kind of takes care of itself because of the intent involved. Um, and so I want yeah. people to conceive of the exercise as a, a hill that keeps getting harder to run up with every single repetition, but they got to get to the top of that hill in the same time. They don't have time to think about how to get from A to B. You just got to go. And um, that takes care of their breathing. Because again, when somebody's sprinting, they don't think about how they're breathing, they just breathe. Because uh, at some point, you know, after crossing the anaerobic threshold, your mouth's got to open and you got to get rid of your CO2. And so um, it's not an option. Uh, and so if I get somebody's intent correct, those little things that we've always tried to micromanage kind of undo themselves. So. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, this has been just an amazing podcast. I don't say that lightly. I've just learned so much and I'm excited to make some changes. And I think the listeners will have, will have, will really enjoy this episode. How, what's the best way for people to find out more about you? Um, through any Website, of our social like media, that. which is uh, automated muscle or Phoenix strength. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a Phoenix strength is Nicole's and I's studio and automated muscles kind of 
uh, the trademark I'm putting down for my kind of operational theory about how to instruct exercise, really how to use this motor learning literature to instruct exercise objectives. Um, and, you know, we have Facebook handles, Instagram handles and all of that stuff that I'm not really privy. That's uh, okay. To, to and, understand and it's but Phoenix strength, isn't it? PH. X strength.com. Yep. 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 Uh, and that'll be or the automated hub. muscle.com as well. Yeah. Automated muscle. So if people go to PHX strength, Phoenix strength.com, mm. you can also go to the footer and I can see automated muscle there and you can see all the social links and email yep. address there. So it's like yep. a central hub for everything else, yep. which will link up. Um, mm. Al, thanks again for taking the Absolutely. time. This has been amazing. And for everyone Thank listening, you to find the blog post for this episode and download the free PDF transcript, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 362. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. 